Can you all see my PowerPoint slide? Yeah. Okay. The kingdom of God and church today is a long message. I've decided to split into half so that I will not take your time. So please bear with me. Scripture verses is taken from Matthew 6, verse 33. 6 e first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I would like to prefer this one, Romans chapter 14, verse 17. The second scripture was in the New Living Version. It says that for the holy nation of God is not food and drink. First thing is it is being right with God. Let's talk about righteousness. And secondly, the Holy Spirit will give us peace and joy when we are right with God. Amen? Amen. So today is Pentecost Sunday. Good morning and shalom to all present, listening and also viewing from Facebook live streaming. Happy Pentecost Sunday. And this is a situation where Christians throughout the world celebrate Pentecost Sunday, 10 days after the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ to heaven. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your holy presence with us this morning. Even though we are not on site, but we are on Zoom, the presence is always omnipresent. And we want to invite you, Lord Holy Spirit, to fill us again as what you have done on the day of Pentecost, to open up our understanding in your word on how we can be a participative member in our Lord Jesus Christ's proclamation on the kingdom of God today. And my message this morning is based on how Pentecost event from the book of Genesis to Revelation is God's blueprint to establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Means we talk about the significance of Pentecost. Then we will have a brief overview on how the team, the central team in the Bible, the kingdom of God, is established through the period of time, through God's covenant with his people from Genesis to Revelation. And after that, we will look at the kingdom of Jesus Christ today. And I would say that this is just a brief summary on covenant. For those of you who desire to know more about the study on the covenant, please join us on our School of Discipleship class due on August 2023, where Pastor Joshua will start the lesson on God's covenant. So basically, my message consists of three components, significance of Pentecost to Christians, and the, how God established his kingdom through his covenant with his people, and lastly, on the kingdom of God in the New Testament. So for a start, let us look at the first topic. What is the significance of Pentecost to the Christians today? In the Hebrew sense, the Feast of Shavuot is celebrated by them. And in Greek, it's called Pentecost Day or Pentecost in common English. And this feast is one of the pilgrim's feasts that God told the Jewish people to celebrate. It occurs 50 days after the feast of the Passover. So initially, this feast called Shavuot or Pentecost Day was celebrated as an agricultural festival. It means they were celebrated at the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. But later through the time, the rabbi determined that it has a greater significance, that it coincides with the great event in the Jewish history where Jehovah God gave his Ten Commandments called the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. Hence, the Feast of Shavuot or the Pentecost in the Old Testament by the Jews is to commemorate and celebrate the occasion in which God's written instructions was given to them how to live. So in summary, according to Judaism, the Feast of Pentecost coincides with the giving of our law. And this happened 50 days after the exodus from Egypt, 
where God gave Israel the law on Mount Sinai. If you do not know the history of Exodus, that means after their Passover meal in Egypt, King Pharaoh was forced to allow the Jews to get out of slavery in Egypt. They have been enslaved for 400 years. And in the wilderness, 50 days after journey in the wilderness, the people have their first Pentecost encounter with God at Mount Sinai. So how is this related to our New Testament's Pentecost Sunday? Why did God allow out of the 365 days to choose this special day throughout the year to allow the Holy Spirit to come upon his disciples? So when Jesus died on Calvary, fulfilling the Passover, he asked them not to go back to Galilee, but stay on in Jerusalem. And 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came and filled the people at the upper room. And this is called the Feast of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So what is the comparison between these two events? From here, we can see that there are many similarities and significance between these two important events where God shows his presence on Mount Sinai and manifests his presence among the disciples in the upper room. Let's look at these two comparisons in a brief summary. So both the events on Old Testament Pentecost and New Testament Pentecost occurred on the 50th day after the Passover. Okay. And the presence of God on Mount Sinai, we can visibly see and hear fire, smoke, and sound of thunder. And that happened in the time of Moses in the wilderness. And 2,000 years ago, God's presence came upon the 120 upper, upper room. And it was accompanied by the sound of the mighty wind, tongues of fire, and the gift of different languages, as you can see in Acts chapter 2. And the third comparison here is, at Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, which we call Torah, and it was written on tablets of stone by the finger of God. Whereas in the New Testament days after Jesus' resurrection, God's new commandments of love were written on tablets of human hearts by the Spirit of the living God, as prophesied by Ezekiel. And this came to pass. And what were the people doing when God gave the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai? While well, waiting for Moses to come down, they started to worship the golden calf. And the wrath of God was upon them when Jesus, uh, when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments. 3,000 people died as a punishment for their sins. 2,000 years ago, in the upper room, after that, the people heard them speaking in their own language, which they have, they them themselves don't know how, what is their language. And when Peter preached the message, 3,000 people believe and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So this is a big contrast here. And what happened to the presence of God in the Old Testament days? Initially, God's presence was symbolized by pillars of cloud and fire to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness to their promised land. And after they have come into the promised land, God's presence then moved into a localized temple where God do not allow King David to build the temple and only allow his son, King Solomon, to build the temple. That's called the Solomon Temple. But 2,000 years ago, God's presence moved from a building to a new temple. And this new temple is where every follower of Jesus Christ they have the Spirit of God living within her or living within him. And this is where we are called the Temple of the Living Spirit. Amen? 
and the incident at Mount Sinai brought fear to the people because 3,000 people were, were punished for their sin. Whereas the incident at Mount Zion at the upper room brought faith to the 12 disciples. They were empowered to witness for Jesus Christ. And what does the Torah teach us? The Torah means teaching. It teaches the people and change the people from the outside. And for those who do not obey God's law, if they don't fear the Lord, as in point number six, which was preached two weeks ago, the failure to obey God's law will bring God's judgment for sin. That's why we say the letter kills. That's the law. Compared to 2,000 years ago, when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120, as what Jesus promised in John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit became the teacher and comforter to all the believers. And this is able to happen where the Holy Spirit changed from within is because of what Jesus has done on the cross. He became the Lamb of God who took away the sin and make us whole before God. So this is where the wages of sin is death. And we can only be made right with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, where our sins have been forgiven. And this is where we now live by God's grace. The Spirit gives life. Amen? And lastly, the Exodus event marked the birth of a new nation that is chosen by God to represent his kingdom on earth, the nation they call Israel, before all Gentile nations. And did they follow? Did they fulfill what God commanded them to do? No. That's why until today, their, their vision has not been fulfilled yet until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Whereas 2,000 years ago, like what we celebrate Pentecost Sunday today, the Pentecost event marked the birth of Christianity, the birth of our church. And the church is seen as the visible kingdom of God on earth. So we are called the New Covenant Church. So brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of Pentecost? Based on the illustration and comparison, you can say that the purpose of Pentecost Sunday is to commemorate and celebrate the descent or the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the followers of Jesus Christ mentioned in Acts chapter 2. And as I mentioned earlier, it's considered as the birthday of the Christian church. So happy birthday to all of us who are watching and listening in. The significance here is the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they were empowered and enabled to spread the gospel message and establish the kingdom of God on earth. And this is always associated with manifestation of spiritual gifts and the unity of believers coming together. And lastly, the significance of, of Pentecost is also seen as the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to all his disciples that he will never leave them or forsake them. And that's where the inauguration of the kingdom of God started as the church was formed. It's a mystery. And this is where the disciples begin to have the mission to share his teaching and gospel and bring people into a relationship with the true and living God. And that is where everyone who follow Jesus are added into the kingdom of God. Amen? So what is this kingdom of God today? Where is the kingdom of God today? Where is the kingdom of God today? What does the Bible tell us? 
In Luke chapter 17, verse 20 to 21, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here, see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God today is within you and I, the followers of Jesus Christ. And let's now look at this kingdom of God. Some of us will feel that it has been mis misunderstood because something that the kingdom of God is heaven above. We are not there yet until we go to heaven. And some of us will think that the church is the kingdom of God. So we are in church, we are in the kingdom of God. We are not in church, we are not in the kingdom of God. And something is, will only come when Jesus comes back, the future millennium. All these definitions or explanations fall short of the real definition of the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God, according to the Bible, teaches us that it is the reign and rule of God over all creation. It means the whole world, the whole universe created by God. And this includes the physical and the spiritual realm. We'll go into that later. So when we say a kingdom, it implies that there must be a presence of a king in authority, ruling over the location. No king, no kingdom. That's why today we say Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He rules over us. Amen? Amen? So now as we look at this kingdom of God, I want to bring us to the second topic. To look at the central theme, kingdom of God for the whole Bible and to see how God established his rule and reign over his people through covenant making. A covenant is a binding arrangement between two parties made under oath. So in the Old Testament, you can see that God made a series of covenants with his people right at the beginning of the first book of Genesis. We call it the creation covenant. God establishes the kingdom through the creation of the world which we are in. He created the universe and everything in it, he declared all to be good. Amen? Amen. And that's where he shows us the picture of the Garden of Eden. It is seen as God's intended kingdom from the very start. The Garden of Eden is displayed as God's intended kingdom where humanity dwell in harmony with God and other creation. So the first covenant God made with Adam in the Garden of Eden, he promised to bless Adam and gave him dominion over the earth if he obeyed God's commandment. Did that really happen or fulfilled? No. Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent and they disobey God's command. So they broke God's covenant with their sin of disobedience and fell short of God's glory. And because of that, they were forbidden to stay in the Garden of Eden and they were chased out of the garden and God put an angel with a flaming sword to guard the entrance. They are not allowed to go back. However, we know in Genesis chapter 3, God promised that the future seed of a woman will bruise the head of the serpent. That means God will continue to make his covenant with his people to restore the kingdom he intended on earth. So after they were chased out of the Garden of Eden, the human race continued to live and sin against God. And God was sad and he allow a great flood to destroy the earth. Only one family was found righteous in the eyes of God during that time. And there was Noah and his family. And that's where after he destroyed the world, God made a second covenant. And that is with Noah. 
we promise in this covenant never to destroy the earth again with flood. And this is where we call it God established a covenant of peace with all living creatures, not only with a human being, all living creatures. And from then on, God said the animal will fear man. That's why man and animal are at enmity until today. And the third covenant that God bring about is Abrahamic covenant, where this is the third covenant God made with Abraham with the promise to make him a great nation. You can see based, based on this chart, God promised Abraham blessings through his descendants and his seeds were multiplied. So the land, the seed and the blessing is where God gave to Abraham. And today, Israel is still fighting over the land. And the blessing, they are still waiting for the blessing. But we already are blessed in the new covenant. So brothers and sisters, this same covenant was passed on through his descendants and reaffirmed with Abraham's future generation of Isaac and Jacob. And this generation lead to the formation of the nation of Israel, which we found in the fourth covenant called the Mosaic Covenant explained in Exodus 19 to 24. So God here make a covenant relationship with his people to free them from 400 years of slavery. And in the wilderness, God gave them the Ten Commandments called the Torah to guide their life and form of worshipping God. So the kingdom of God during this time is expressed through God's covenant relationship with the nation of Israel. They are called to be a holy nation and live according to God's law. So the establishment of Israel as a nation under king, starting with Saul, David, and Solomon, is seen as a partial realization of the kingdom of God on earth. So after they have entered the promised land, they start conquering and there were kings. And King David was the fifth covenant God made with, he promised to establish King David's dynasty forever and to make one of his descendants a king that would reign over an eternal kingdom. So out of King David's future descendants, someone will rise up to be a king and rule an eternal kingdom. So these are the five covenants we can record and see in the Old Testament. And this is where the kingdom of God in the Old Testament here refers to a future reality where God will establish lordship and sovereign reign over the earth. And this time, the prophets of old, if you look through all the book of the prophets, they did not use the word kingdom of God, but they often spoke of a future messianic kingdom. This future messianic kingdom says that God's reign will be fully established. They anticipated a time of peace, justice, and righteousness, where God's rule will be acknowledged by all the nations around them. It means finally God will put his royal power and rule and to end justice and oppression by the world's evil power and establish his rule of righteousness, peace, justice, joy for humanity. Are we there yet today? No. And all the people would worship God and live in harmony and peace with each other. So all these Old Testament covenant, which I mentioned established by God's rule and reign over his people in different ways, point towards the ultimate establishment of God's, God's kingdom to the coming of Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, all the Old Testament covenants are connected to the new covenant established through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is portrayed as the long-awaited Messiah. He came to inaugurate the kingdom of God by fulfilling the law and became the ultimate sacrifice for sin, making a way for sinful people to be reconciled to God. So through Jesus' death and resurrection, we can say that Jesus established the new covenant, which is based on faith in Jesus and Jesus' work on the cross. So we can say today that the new covenant is a covenant of grace in which God forgives our sins when we have faith in Jesus by grace. And God gives his people the Holy Spirit to empower them to live a life that is pleasing to him. That's why on the day of Pentecost, which we celebrate today as Pentecost Sunday, God gave the Holy Spirit to all of us to empower us to live a life that is pleasing to him and also to witness for him about the kingdom, living in the kingdom of God. So hence, through God's covenant, through different periods of time in the Bible, we can see how the kingdom of God has been established as a central team. So it reflects God's desire to establish his rule over his people and bring about the three R's. The three R's are restoration, redemption, and reconciliation to all creation. And this full realization is ultimately revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's why today you and I can see through the enablement of the Holy Spirit living in us, the work of God in our life and in this world. So that is how I show you a chronology on the central theme of the kingdom of God established from the book of Genesis right up to the book of Revelation. And today we are in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is found within us. So the kingdom of God in the New Testament refers to the reign and rule of God in the hearts and life of people who are called Christ disciples. Are we Christ disciples today? Yes. yes. So we are now having the reign and rule of God in our hearts. And there's a future culmination of God's redemptive plan. We are still a pilgrims on earth. We haven't reached our destination yet. So though we are in the kingdom of God, what are the aspects of the kingdom of God that we need to know to enable us to have a deeper walk with God while living on this earth? So the first one I want to share on the few aspects of the kingdom of God in the New Testament is it's a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus Christ revealed on earth is a heavenly kingdom. It is not of this world. Jesus answered to Pilate when he was arrested and accused by the Jewish council. He said to Pilate in John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So Jesus thought that the kingdom of God is not an earthly political kingdom. That's what the early followers of Jesus thought Jesus came to set up a political system to overthrow the Roman Empire. No, it's not a political kingdom, but it's a spiritual reality. It's a realm where God's rule is acknowledged through the submission in the hearts and obedience in the lives of the believers. And this, when the holy nation of Israel is in our hearts, the Holy Spirit will work in our life and our life will be characterized by righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, as mentioned in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. 
And we also know that according to Daniel 7 verse 14, it was prophesied in the book of Daniel, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one shall not be destroyed. And this is the heavenly kingdom that Jesus came and he inherited the kingdom promised to King David, where the angel in Luke 1, verse 30 says to Mary, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So we are living with the eternal hope in the kingdom of God. Even as we depart from this world, we will still be living because the kingdom of God, there will be no end. It's your eternity, brothers and sisters. So besides being a spiritual kingdom, there is a present and future tension that I mentioned. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God through his ministry while he was on earth, his death and resurrection. So the kingdom of God is already present, but not fully realized. So the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God is now available to all of us who turn to God in faith, repent of our sins, and follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And when we set our eyes at the, in the spiritual atmosphere of this spiritual kingdom of God, it's a realm of peace, justice, love, and compassion. So this kingdom is experienced now through only faith in Jesus Christ, through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us and the presence of God's grace and power in the life of us who are believers. So this is where we can still live with, victoriously while on earth in the kingdom of God living within us today. And brothers and sisters, the full consummation of the kingdom of God will only be fully established and fulfilled at the second coming or return of Jesus Christ. I'll give you an illustration. I don't know how accurate it can be. Just imagine the permanent resident versus the citizenship in a foreign country. So there are many people who migrated to a country and they apply for permanent resident status, but they are not citizens in that land. So a permanent resident in a foreign country has no full benefits and no rights to vote to enjoy the benefit of that country. Compared to a citizen, he has 100% protection 100% social welfare benevolence in that country. And citizens have full constitutional voting rights to live in that country, while the permanent resident status have no voting rights in that country. So to be a citizen of a new country, one has to give up the old citizenship of the previous country and swear by oath their loyalty and commitment to the new country. So the question for us today, who are Christians, where we call ourselves, we are in the kingdom of God. Are we truly citizens of God's kingdom in our living? Or we are just behaving like a permanent resident with no 100% loyalty and commitment, but just to enjoy the temporary benefits of both worlds, but missing the real rights that are only meant for true citizens in the kingdom of God. Because the true citizens in the kingdom of God will have the eternal hope and eternal life when we leave this world. So I put this as a thought for each and every one of us to reconsider. 
since it's Pentecost Sunday. The third aspect of the kingdom of God is, sorry, this just I've just mentioned, transformation and values. So when we submit to the king in the kingdom of God, it must bring about transformation in the individual and society. This involves a radical change of heart, a new birth, and a process of sanctification. As we willingly obey and submit to the authority and rulership of the king in his kingdom. So it started with our trust and faith in action and commitment. And when we put our faith in action and commitment to studying the word of God, prayer, spending intimacy in fellowship together, we will eventually grow into a deep, intimate relationship with God. So the transformation will bring about changes in our individual life and in our community. And this will result in kingdom values, which will be lived out by the citizens in the kingdom. And kingdom values are these, love, mercy, forgiveness, justice, and humility. And when we have all these kingdom values, Around us, the kingdom will be a realm of peace, justice, love, and compassion. And all these kingdom values will be seen by those non-believers around us. And that's where we are the salt and light to the community. The kingdom of God is universal and open to all who repent, who believe in Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, and follow Him. So it is not limited to an ethnic group or nation or social group. So the gospel of Jesus Christ on the kingdom of God breaks down all barriers and welcomes people from every tribe, every language, and every culture. That's why though the physical forces are trying to prevent the kingdom of God to be established, God in His own way, will break down this barrier because all humans are equal in the sight of God. Amen? And lastly, the aspect of the kingdom of God in New Testament is about the future fulfillment as in Revelation eleven fifteen, The New Testament looks forward to the future fulfillment of the kingdom of God as mentioned in the book of Revelation. The kingdom of God will be realized as the new heaven and new earth. And when this happens, God's reign will be fully established. There will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more death. And all creation will acknowledge Jesus Christ's kingship. His kingdom will replace all earthly authority. As what was preached last Sunday, on Revelation 11, 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So brothers and sisters, these are the five aspects of the kingdom of God in the New Testament. There are many more aspects because of time, you can read on your own and discover what God has in plan for us. So with this, I will just talk about find the part, how do we apply what we know and hear today for the church. So based on the comparative studies of the Old Testament Shavuot and the New Testament Pentecost, we know that God is still working out the kingdom of God and is still being established until today. Amen? And based on the central theme of the kingdom of God presented throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, so based on the brief studies on covenants made between God and mankind through the ages, we can see the plan of God 
and his hand in establishing the reign and rule of God in the hearts and lives of his people. And this kingdom of God is realized and revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So today, if you and I are followers of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is already within us. And because the kingdom of God is already within us, we should not, as taught last Sunday, to keep the one talent and bury it in the ground. The one talent given to us is our salvation. We should be sharing the salvation, the great commission of Jesus Christ and bring in more souls into the kingdom. So that's why believers are to continue Jesus Christ's mission. And this is found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38. Typo error there. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So sisters and brothers, we are called to be sent out. Sent out to the harvest field. The harvest is plentiful. So let us remember that this is a great commission. And in order to do that, the Pentecost Sunday event was what Jesus promised to all those who saw him before he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit empowered believers to do his work and be overcomers in life. And this is where Acts 1 verse 8, I just read, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's why the gospel is still spreading throughout the whole world until today. So God is sending you and I out of FCT, out of FCT premise to reach out to all those in our surrounding neighborhood. And lastly, uh, making disciples of all nations to be citizens. So Jesus mentioned in Matthew 28, the Great Commission 18 to 20, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So this is a promise of Jesus. While we are in the kingdom of God, He's still reigning and ruling over our life and He's still guiding us step by step as the pilgrim on this earth to fulfill what he has called us to do. So in summary, brothers and sisters, we can conclude that after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the establishment of the church through the work of the Holy Spirit is considered as an expression of the kingdom of God on earth. So all believers are called to live as citizens of this kingdom and with their role in proclaiming the gospel and reflecting its values in our lives. So brothers and sisters, with this message today on the significance of the Pentecost, the covenant God made through the ages to work out his kingdom and the New Testament church, we are the visible church on the kingdom of God on earth today. I will just say that we should not forget that our salvation is by faith and by grace, and we should be obedient and submitted to the authority of God to do what he called us to do. So we just want to, at this moment, close in prayer. And I pray that this message will stir us to desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Pentecostal Sunday today. Okay, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you and repent before you, Lord, 
to know, Lord, that you have called us to be your disciples, not just to have salvation and go to heaven, but, Lord, to be good citizens in the kingdom of God on earth, that we will proclaim your word and your message and reach out for more people who are yet to know Jesus as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And we pray, Lord, that you use us, Lord, no, wherever we are and whatever situation we are, we know, Lord, that you will provide for us your grace and the empowerment to accomplish what you have called us to do. And Father, for those who are going through struggles in their life right now, be it in work, in finances, or in health, we want to proclaim that we are in the atmosphere of the kingdom of God, where your anointing of healing and restoration can still work. And Lord, we claim by faith and ask for the infilling and outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come upon everyone that stretch out their needs to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus, every obstacle is broken and the infilling of the Holy Spirit of life will come upon each and every situation among the hearers right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for redemption, for reconciliation, and Lord, for also restoration of perfect health and finances, peace in the family, in everything. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me just uh, stop live streaming. Thank you everyone for listening in. May the Lord bless you. Blessed Pentecostal Sunday once again. See you again next week. Bye.